session. For those that are staying in Oyo State, they are well aware of how heavy rain was today. So network may not be favorable if we are having our mics on and if we are having our screens on. So Mr. Yinka, please kindly close your screen. I like your cap. Thank you, sir. Kindly close your screen. Thank you. Can you close your screen, please? Can kindly you close your screen? Mr. Yinka, I can still see your face. I can still see your face. We are not supposed to be seeing your face, Mr. Yinka. Thank you very much. All right. So please, I want to hand over to our facilitator now. Mr. Yinka, I can still see your face. Please kindly close your screen. Thank you very much. So can I come on, Mr. Femi? Mr. Yinka, please close your screen, please. We've seen your face, we've seen your cap. Thank you very much. All right, uh, may Aposimane, please, you can begin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Femi. God bless you so much. Thank Amen. you. I, I, I do really appreciate this opportunity you've given to me to share with our brothers and I just believe that this will be a beginning of a great relationship between us. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, as we all know, the uh, topic for this uh, today's meeting is uh, common disease in poultry and its preventive uh, uh, measures. Praise God. Hey, I'm so sorry to add praise God to it. <laughs> you know, this is so we we want to identify ourselves with uh, various. Uh, disease in poultry, and at the same time, try to offer solutions, uh, uh, try to see what measures can be put in place to prevent some of these diseases too. But before we go into that, I will just want us to have for the definition of disease is all about. Disease is a change condition from the normal state of health. As we all know, anytime we have issues with our body as human beings, we say, oh, we feel we are sick and we have to visit the hospital for the doctor to check us through so that we can come back on our feet. So also it is with uh, pottery beds. And as our brother said earlier on, I've done pottery close to 14 years now. Even though I, I pray the gospel and when I finally relocated to Ghana where my mother comes from, I'm basically half Nigerian, half uh, Ghanaian. So my dad is from Oyo State, from Shaki to be precise, and my mom is from the Volta region. So when the Lord instructed me to return back to Ghana fully, I came and I began ministry. But at a point in time, I began to have a dream. And I saw how my cousin in Nigeria years back was into poultry farming. When we left the university, he went to farming. And we all were just around him. So when I got into Ghana, I said, no, there's something I have to do. So what should I do? And I began to have an idea. And the idea was to go into farming. And I think uh, for close to 14 years now, before then, before we got to this stage, uh, the first uh, number of beds I had on the 28th of June 2011 was about 100 beds, which I have to buy them from, 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 from a farmer so that I'll begin to use that one to learn. So over the years, gradually we've been able to accumulate some experiences when it comes to poultry farming. And I think that's what we want to share together today because it is good to be in the four corners of an institution to learn, maybe to, to, to learn something about farming. But another, time, another thing too is it's important for us to practically have it done on ground. And over the years, I've come to realize that farmers are well experienced when it comes to practicality because they are right on the farm and they've been able to identify themselves with viral kind of diseases and been able to find solution to it on their own or through the veterinary uh, uh, hospital or doctors or something. So disease itself is a chain condition from, what, from the normal state of health. So it happens to beds. So today we'll be looking at uh, various kind of diseases in poultry, and most of the time I always tell farmers that if there's if there's a problem with your beds, if there's any form of disease that you have noticed with your flocks, 
the first the best thing is for you to take samples of this flock to the vet so that they'll be able to look at it and i always tell them when you get to the vet they have uh, vital information that have to be provided or made available to to the to the to the veterinary uh, doctor so that he'll be able to know exactly what to where to start from with the flock which you brought into their facility so if you go to the vet office you have to have this information in mind the number and the age of vets are very important you need to provide this information to the Bed, the number of age of your beds, the number and the age of your beds, very important. Number two, when the disease was discovered, when did you discover this very disease? When did you see it happening or when did you see it come up within the flux? What are the symptoms of disease that you have seen? The beds you brought to us at the vet, what are the symptoms you've been able to identify with these beds? And what, and how many? beds have been affected so you have to let the vet know how many beds that has been affected and again how many of them have died is there any that you have lost so far you should be able to provide this information to the vet then finally what are the actions that has been taken already is there any medication given to the beds earlier on before bringing them to the vet so you have to be able to provide all these information to the vet. So it's important for farmers to know that you can't just uh, handle beds anyhow, because for currently we've discovered that, you know, investing into poultry farming is very expensive. So for every bed that dies, it touches your heart. You've lost an amount of money. So you should be able to have this vital information yes yeah, somewhere written in your in your books or whatever wherever your records are booked somewhere that you should be able to provide this information to the vet so that they will be able to help you immediately it's just like when we go to the hospital the doctor asks us various kinds of questions and we have to provide information they need so that they'll be able to see to us and help us comes out of that particular disease that we are having at a time so so there are things I believe that farmers should know. So what are the farmers? What should farmers know? So what, what should, in spite of the foregoing, the farmer needs to deal with some of the disease problem himself, especially in emergency. So there are times whereby it is not going to the vet doctor that is the immediate thing. You have to deal with this, some of these diseases as an emergency case so that you're able to save these uh, flocks from uh, having been infected from probably one or two that are already infected already because no poultry disease can easily spread easily and so fast. So you should be able to uh, be able to provide an emergency uh, treatment for your flocks. It's very, very important. It's very, very important. So how are diseases caused? How do we come by diseases in poultry farming? An animal is known to be healthy when all its organ is, func is functional, function normally. An animal is considered to be healthy when all its organs in its body functions perfectly. In the case of chickens, the bird moves briskly, wears a bright appearance, eats regularly, and drinks as often as necessary. The feathers are bright colors, the wattles are red, well erected, and it decides solid pieces with no green or yellow or red stains. So when your beds are in good condition, these are the things you might find the bed in. The bed has to eat very well. The comb of the bed has to be bright. The wattles have to be bright and erect. It has to discharge solid pieces. There should be no green pool. There should not be yellow or red stains. So the feathers too must be, the feathers is no mess, sticking to down feathers. The feathers must not stick down. You know, sometimes you know, when you have a caustic problem, you see what happened to the birds. So the birds must look very sharp. Their feathers must be white and bright color. That shows that the bed is okay. So it's important for you to see all the, when your bed is looking so well in this very direction, that shows that the bed is very okay. So prominent among all these things, 
there are always visible symptoms that sometimes the bed has to pose. So there are symptoms that the bed will begin to pose and you begin to realize that, no, the way this bed is looking from what I know this bed to be, there's a problem with the bed. And that is when you have to begin to take an action towards this quickly so that you don't have these uh, symptoms affect all the flux at a, at a go. I've had a challenge before. I remember in 2018, I lost closely about uh, 1,550 beds because I was, I was not very quick and fast enough to identify a particular sickness that came into the, into, the, in, into the pen. So by the time I knew it, it has gone, most of the beds were affected and eventually they began to die one after the other before I have to quickly look for a solution to it. So since then, I've not really lost such number of beds again. The little things are maybe sometimes I lose them through stamping. Probably if the place is uh, crowded and maybe I have quite a number of them in the Buddha house and I've not separated them, separated them quickly at a particular time. Maybe at the time they want to feed, that's why you can explain some kind of uh, stampede and all these stuff. But when it comes to diseases, God has been very faithful that uh, he has helped me to this stage that I've not really lost much beds to disease because I'm always on time. I take note of these beds when they are okay. I see how they look. I know what they have to, how they have to look like. So when there's a sickness, I should be able to know that no, these beds are not doing well or these beds are afflicted. So now there are signs that you have to begin to see if there's sudden death, if the, the feathers are ruffled, if you have ruffled feathers and there's sudden death, wet vent, drop droppings maybe watery droppings stain droppings diarrhea discolored and swollen comb and wattle closed and watery eyes paralysis leg weakness loss of appetite gaping for breath emaciation and low egg production you should know there's a problem at the farm so when you begin to experience sudden death ruffled feathers wet vent droppings stain droppings diarrhea discolored and swollen comb and wattles close and watery eyes paralysis leg weakness loss of appetite gapping for breath emaciation and low egg production then there's a problem that something has to be done quickly and many times there are some of these diseases that attack uh, chickens that is just only on a minus state that it is not very fatter so sometimes we can really handle these ones quickly but there are some of them too that you need to take to the vet because you could discover that it cannot easily be handled there was a time i had a problem i never knew it was my my mycoplasma so i thought it was chorizia i that time i didn't even know the difference between mycoplasma and chorizia so i was thinking the bed was having chorizia but it was not chorizia it was mycoplasma until i have to go google i have to you know tell google the case what it is and describe the situation on ground and i got to realize that it was not even chorizia but it was mycoplasma that was a problem at that time and in fact before i got to know that it was uh, mycoplasma you know i lost some of these beds already and it got to a point that some other friends began to uh tell me some things to they began to offer some kind of measures so that I'll be able to apply them and see if this best can survive it. And I did apply some few measures. And I realized that those measures that were given to me was rather dangerous, that it rather kill this bed but not make them fine. So I've come to learn from this too that, see, many times when things happen, why do we have Google there? We can quickly Google and read about it, describe the situation that the best are in at that time, and you get very good uh result that, that when you begin to apply those solutions that have been offered you begin to have uh you know you see that these bears will begin to gradually stop dying and you have a very wonderful uh bears at the end of the day so i i i was able to clearly identify what chorizia is and what mycoplasma is and i did what exactly google told me to do and i began to see a change in the flux and that was the way i survived it 
So there are some of these diseases that can, it's a minor one that can easily be handled. When I see firepox in my floors, I don't consider it to be anything serious. Because over the years, the first time I saw firepox, my heart began to beat. I saw the wattles with pores on it, on their feet, on their eyes. Eyes was becoming watery. I said, what is this? I never knew it was firepox. Until when I have to speak to a friend, a very young boy, who was far younger than me, but he was experienced. So he was in poultry farming before even I started. And a young man came to inspect my best and told me that this is firepox. I said, what is the solution? He said, when you just give them injection, everything will clear off. So just place them on antibiotic vitamin just to build up their immune system so that the firepox cannot weaken them. They can still have access to food and water. And I did that exactly. And by the time I know it, I began to find a solution to, I injected them and everything vanished. So when I see firepox, I consider it to be a minor thing. I, I'm not afraid of firepox. But when you see gumboro, your heart begins to beat. That's not a, a minor thing. Until today, that probably we've been able to find a solution to that, that when bears have gumboro after we, they've been vaccinated, and unfortunately, that crisis come up, that's what you have to do. Or probably mistakenly, you could you did not you know vaccinate this space against Gumboro and it happens. You lose quite a number of them, but there are things you can do that can make you still save some of these beds. So over the years, we've come to know all these things and learned all these things. So sometimes there are some of the disease that is just in a minor stage whereby you can easily handle, but there are some of them you have to see the bed doctor so that they can do further examination on the beds. They do the post on the dead beds so that they can find a solution for you. Today, we should be thankful that there are several drugs that are available to help us be able to combat this disease in poultry. It was not like those days when our fathers were growing. It was very difficult to find medication for, for beds. But today, various kind of medication is on the market that you can easily find for every disease and it will easily ease up these problems and the best will come back to their normal stage. So now we want to look at uh, what are disease producing agents. So we want to look at disease, when you say disease producing agents, these are common disease producing agents known to affect chickens. And these are bacteria, these are protozoa, these are viruses, molds and internal and external parasites. So when we say disease producing agents, we are talking about the various bacteria and protozoa and viruses that affect this bed that makes them go sick so that be, that makes them become unhealthy so these are the disease producing agents so these are the things that brings about diseases in poultry so we have bacteria bacteria are very minute one cell plants which can only be seen under the microscope no one can see a bacteria with his eyes a great many of these uh, microorganisms are beneficial to mankind, but only a few of them are known to cause disease. Some of the examples of disease they cause are respiratory infection, coryzea, and other sicknesses in poultry. So bacteria are very dangerous when your best, uh, when any bacteria affects your bed, it turns into something just like a micro, 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 uh, plasma, plasma. You know, it's a bacteria. So it's a bacteria producing agent that can affect your bed. Um, so we sorry, should be able to notice that. that we have a disease producing agents and we have bacteria. We have protozoa. Protozoa are also microorganisms only seen through the microscope. No one can see protozoa, uh, protozoa by his, with his own eyes. You know, they are most of the time they are responsible for a disease such as cosidiosis and back head in turkeys. So it is protozoa that causes procedures in chicken. And we have viruses too. And these are other disease causing agents which are so minute that they cannot even be seen through the microscope. Some of these diseases caused by viruses are firepox, Newcastle, and infectious bronchitis and gumboro. So you see, we have viruses, we have protozoas, we have bacteria. So yeah, Mr. Are, uh, sorry to cut you short, please. Sorry to cut you short. Mr. Megbon, please kindly mute your mic and shut your video. Thank you very much. Please, thank you. You can go on, sir. Yeah, so we have bacteria, we have protozoa, we have viruses, and all these are uh, disease-producing agents. 
So as I said earlier on, when you have anything like mycoplasma, it's a bacteria that has affected the bed that causes, uh, uh, how do we call it, all, all the respiratory problems, CRD, and all those things. So when you have protozoas, that's where we have coccidiosis in, in poultry bears, when a bear has to yeah, affected by protozoa. You know, when we have viruses affecting the bears, we talk about bear flu, we talk about foul pulse, we talk about Newcastle disease, infectious bronchitis, and we talk about, a, a, how do we call it, a gumboro. And we have molds, and these are fungi. And the, the most important disease known to be caused by molds are white combs, yeah, white combs. And these are fungi, you know, and you know, and they cause the mold. So most of the time, I'm always very careful where I put my feet in and where I get my feet from. So you have to get your feet from a very good source whereby they have anti molds in the feet that can come. Because most of the time, you know, where we keep our feet, we feel they are safe. We feel the place is not so cold that uh, to build up molds in these feet. Recently, I had to raise some beds about, uh, I, I, I brooded about 2,000 beds. And I bought the fish over for one minute so that I could use all those fish for, for the bed throughout the brooding stage. Because where my farm is to where I'll be getting the fish is a big distance. And I realized that after about two weeks, I picked some of the fish. You could see that there was some moles in them. But because I was not afraid, it didn't affect this bed because in that feed, I got it from a very good source. And there are anti moles in it. So it was able to help combat that uh, mold, that fungus that fungi is uh, that cause that mold. So it's very important where we get our fish from. So we have parasites too. We have parasites. And, and these are many multi-celled animals, you know, and the, which attacks animals in general. This includes internal, we have internal parasites, the roundworms and the hookworms, and we have the external ones, the ticks and the lice. So it is very important for us to take note of it. These diseases cause, uh, producing agents. So we have to know that these are the things that causes all these problems. So when you have a problem in your bed, you should be able to know the exact uh, uh, the, the, the exact uh, agent that has affected or afflicted that bed so that you'll be able to deal with it appropriately. With you. So we, we want to look at the ways whereby disease have been transmitted. So transmission of disease, transmission of disease. How do we come by some of these diseases in poultry beds? Yeah, so we can, we have about, uh, we ha I have close about how many ways here? I have about, yes, probably about six or seven. I, I have one, feed and water, feed and water. Two, soil and litter. Three, contact. Four, we have carriers that can uh, spread uh, diseases to the air. We have mechanical means and we have importation of picking. So sometimes where we import our best to can be a problem. So one, feed and water. Droppings and discharge from the mud of infected beds contaminate the feed and water troughs and, and are picked up by uh, other, other chickens. You know, when you have one bed affected in the pen, and you don't quickly identify that bed and take that bed out. As the bed goes closer to the water and deep its mouth into the water, uh, automatically, you know, that bed has infected that water at that time. Many times I go closer to these beds when they are feeding, and you see that sometimes you see that some of this food comes out of their mouth in the form of a saliva or something very thick, and other beds begin to rush for it immediately. So you see, it is easy to spread disease. So that's why what I do is, every morning I give food to the bears, I stand by to watch the bears. Even, we have most of these bears in the, in the cage, but we still watch. I tell the workers that anytime you give them food in the morning, this is the best time you can identify uh, disease in, in, in the bear. You can know that the bears are not feeling fine. Any bear that is afflicted or has a problem, it's easy for you to know early in the morning. Because when every other bear has rushed for food and that one has separated itself, you can easily pick that one out and begin to find out what is wrong with the bed. Sometimes it might, not, it might not be any form of disease, but it can be an accumulation of overnight feed in the gut that has not really gone down. So that one, you just give water to the bed and it becomes okay. But when it is a problem, you will know and begin to find out what exactly is the disease now and what should I do to save this bed quickly. 
But when you are not so uh, hard with observant, you don't watch your best, you just give them feed and you leave and go to work. By the time you know, in the next three days, that very sickness has gone around all the beds. Every one of them is having this problem. So many times, beds can, can transmit disease through, the, through their feeding and through the water they drink too. So the solid and the litter. Yeah, disease producing agents are normally found in the soil where the, the remains, where, where yes, they, 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 they are found in the soil and they can remain there for a very long time. That is why anytime I finish with the production, and probably maybe I'm raising beds now for Christmas, after I finish selling all these beds, I make sure I deal, I I I I ideally work on the Buddha house or wherever the beds were before I took them out. You know, I make sure every hole is sealed because they can leave all forms of disease inside the soil. There are all these little holes we see, we don't block them, we bring new beds, and those are the things that is affecting the beds. But you know that poultry beds always, they always want to peck something, they always want to pick something from the ground. They want to suck something from the soil. So if there, there are holes that they can ha easily have access to the soil, definitely they will be infected because the parent beds that were there, or the mature beds that were there that you took out of the place, left something, left a particular disease behind, and this can affect the new beds. So I always tell farmers that anytime you are bringing new beds into uh, a brooder house, that brooder house has to be properly taken care of. Or anytime you move bed from a particular pen into another, and you are bringing a new one into that pen, you must make sure you take very good care of that pen. Block all holes. Make sure there is no access for the beds to have. There is no way the beds can have access to the ground, to the soil. Otherwise, they will pick all kinds of sickness from the soil. And from the litter, the litter we picked and bring into the pen for the best to, 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 to walk on or to sleep on. The litter too, you have to watch the litter very well. It is, we can spread disease easily through the litter. So easy, so easy. Sometimes where you are picking the litter from, you know, the place is not, maybe the workers that were there from the sawmill, you know, these people are not, they don't know what, uh, they are not so, so clean. The hygiene there is so bad. They move to places, they come with their sandal, they step on this uh, litters and all kinds of, so they bring all kinds of disease there. And I've come to realize that most of the bears that have issue with lice, most of the time they come from the litters. Most of the local bears that go to this place, to, most of them go to play in these litters and we go for it and bring it to our farm. Most of the local bears, they have uh, lice in there, so they can easily spread disease and, uh, uh, you know, they can easily infect your bears easily. So let's watch our soil and litters is something you have to really watch. It's easy to spread disease through this means. Transmission of disease through soil and litter is very possible and fast. So contact, where infected beds are allowed to move together with healthy ones, is, is very possible for them to spread disease. Yes, I, I had a problem with Coriza the first time at my farm, which I didn't even know anything about Coriza. But why most of the beds was, were affected was because i never knew immediately they find out that an infected bear's eye is swollen they go peck it or you know when the the eye is itching and they rub the eyes on the feathers the healthy bears go to peck the feather and that's how they get infected so it was is it no it was before within two three days the thing drastically spread all over the place and i lost quite a number of beds so most of the time we have to watch it. When you find any bed that is not feeling okay, if you discover any sluggish movement or you are not okay with the movement of that bed, quickly take that bed out of the pen so that it doesn't affect the other ones. So, so through contact, so beds can easily, for instance, if a bed is sneezing or gasping for breath or coughing and, and you don't pick that bed out. So most of the, how do I get to know when my beds are coughing? I go there in the night. Because that's the best time you're able to identify a bear that is having a problem with re having a respiratory problem. When you go there in the night, and you, you know, normally bears have to sleep in the night, everywhere has to be quiet. But when you go there in the night and you begin to find those unusual sounds, it is easy for you to even identify that very bear quickly and you can easily pick the bear out of it. Otherwise, by the time you know it, the next three, four, five, six days, seven days, the thing has spread and many of them are affected. So that's another thing to show. We have to watch out for this contacting. So we have to, and carriers. Some chickens may harbor the germs without, 
themselves showing signs of the disease. But they carry the disease to, to other beds. You know, there are times whereby, you know, you know, there are some beds who have really uh, built their immune system. No matter when our beds are 16 weeks, the immune system is so built up that, you know, they can't be affected or any, any form of sickness cannot really affect them. So, but before the 16 weeks, they might have been able to have, to build up this particular kind of sickness in them. And it's easy for them to, trans, you know, transmit this disease. So some of them are carriers, even though their immune system are strong enough to fight against what's supposed to have affected them, but they can easily transmit that particular disease to, to other beds. So that's why we have to watch out when we are, we are bringing in new beds to where old beds are. We don't have to add new beds to old beds, otherwise it's easy for the old beds to, to afflict or to, to infect, uh, how do we call it, the, the new beds. So we just have to watch out for that. So some of these beds are carriers, just like the way we have human carriers in other form of diseases too. The disease will not affect that person, but it can easily spread it too. So we have to watch out for that too. And we have you know, rats, dogs, and cats, and maybe some kind of farm animals to eat worms, you know, cockroaches. There was a time I suffered drastically from the infection of cockroach. I thought maybe when best, uh, you know, when they catch a cockroach and tear it apart and eat it, nothing will happen until I began to see that something will happen. So sometimes I make sure that wherever I'm trying to bring new bears into a pen, every possible uh, prevention that I have to do so that I won't have cockroaches come into the pen, I need to do it. Because these are external carriers too. We have a uh, bed, you know, bears too can carry disease. They carry bed flus and from one farm to the other. So we have to really watch it. So we have bears that are that naturally carry, they have their, their immune system are so strong that the disease in them cannot do them anything, but they can transmit that disease. We have external forces like uh, uh, rats, dogs, cats, and other animals. So we have to watch out for this. So these are another form whereby diseases are easily spread. Air, air, we have airborne diseases too. As we have it in human, currently we can we have what we call, they say the mouse pus or something, monkey pus. So also in birds, birds can have easily respiratory disease through, through the air and they can have bed flea free to through the air. So we should watch out for that. So many times what I do is when I realize that there's a bed flea infestation, a bed flea has come into the system, I try to do all my possible best for, for I try to, you know, I do some funny things. I try to cover some place so that some kind of air will not come in. Just open a, a little part of the, of the pen so that air can just pass through for the best to be okay. But I always try to avoid dust. You know, like maybe air, be, you know, it does being blown by air. You know, I try to avoid all these things so that eventually I don't have a problem with air flu or something like that. So we have mechanical means too. We have mechanical means whereby, you know, you allow people to come into your farm all the time. You know, they can easily bring disease. You have a farmer friend who comes from his farm. You know, oh, come and see my best. My best are doing very well. Thank you. It's good for you to invite to come and see your best. But there must be some distance. You know, you should have an office that should be able to entertain the farmer. When he comes into the place, he goes straight into the office, wear a different shoe, a different clothes, and you bring it closer to your pen. That one is good. You can do that. But if you don't put all these biosecurity measures in place and you allow anybody to come close to your best, it's very dangerous. Disease can easily be spread through that same means. So now we have, uh, so the mechanical means to your, that is the boot, your clothing. As I said earlier, you have to really take note of these things. The water trust, the feeders, all these things are, 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 are things that can easily spread disease. So when you are moving a feeder from one pen to the other, make sure you wash it and disinfect it before taking it to the other pen. Oh, these beds are together. I can just move it. When you move it, the air result might not be very good, might be very funny. So let's take note of that. Importation of chickens too. Most of the time, we have to know where we get our day old chicks from. This is very important. Most of the parent beds will have a problem and if they can you know, infect the eggs and the eggs will be hatched and the day old chicks will have a problem. So this is very important. Let's see, let's be very conscious of where we get our day old chicks from. Yeah, this is very important. So how do we prevent this disease? How do we prevent this disease? So now we are, we are, we are the prevention of disease. So the following measures are recommended. 
So we must have one disease free stock. So you must know where you are getting your day Uchi from. It's very important. That one can help you start preventing disease on your farm. Some years back, we had a problem with a particular farm here in Ghana. Virtually, most farmers, everyone who takes his bed from that place, the best kid would die. When they are three weeks old, expect them to start dying. They were having a serious problem until when the farmers came together and said, no, we're not, we have to let this farm know that their hatchery has a problem. There's a problem with their hatchery. And before they began to look at that, most of us left the place and began to take our bed from a different source. So it is important for us to look at where our best are. So you must always have a, a disease-free stock. A disease free stock. That's the first uh, preventive method. Yeah, the first measure that has to, that has to be taken as recommended now. A disease free stock. Two, brooding. During the brooding stage two, we can we can always infect our beds. So I'm always conscious when it comes to brooding. Where I get my star dust from is very important. I don't even put my bed directly on the dust. So what I do is I want to introduce the beds to the feet for the first week they come in. So I put a white paper on the dust. I spread it everywhere. I introduced to some, I did introduce that to a farmer some time ago. The next time I went there, he has solo tape holding all the papers at every edge. That doesn't want any sadders to come on it by that time. But it's not necessary to use any solo to hold the papers. As far as you spread the beds and the bed comes on the on the paper, when the first people they make the first time they arrive, can even stick the whole thing down well for you. So your, the brooding to is very, the brood state is very, very important. You must take various measures in place, put various measures in place so that you can avoid diseases spreading. So brooding, you must, it must not be overheating and uh, underheating too. I don't do charcoal, like uh, the traditional method, I don't do that again. Over the years, about 10 years now, I do the gas system. I was able to construct a local banner, and that is the banner I used to uh, for my brooding. And I came to realize why I stopped uh, using the traditional method of uh, brooding beds, maybe using the charcoal and a pot, or using the charcoal or whatever thing you put the charcoal in. I realized that when you put the charcoal in the in the pen, in the brooder house, and you stand up, the heat is always up. But when you go to the corners of the brooder, you bend down, you realize that you can't find the heat there. I said, no, this is not helping the bed. So for the first three days or the first one with the best camp. Please, sorry, there was an interruption somewhere. So sorry for that. So for the first, uh, for the first uh, one. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Are you there? I, I think our facilitator is having network issues. Okay, uh, I think our facilitator is probably network issues. So we apologize. Kindly stay tuned. I think he's having network issues. And we hope to have him back as soon as possible. Um, okay, before he joins us, please uh, kindly prepare your questions for those of us that have questions to ask. Please uh, prepare your questions um, so that when it is time, we are going to call for questions so please prepare your questions yes so sorry for that at least i i i went off uh, yeah so i'm back okay, now so sorry. as i was saying sorry. yeah we are still on the uh some of the preventive methods when it comes to disease how do we prevent them i spoke about the, the disease free stock and i was on the brooding so the brooding we must ensure that the heat is adequate not overheating or underheating you know, and it's important because the first one week when your best come into the Buddha house, it's good for them to have the adequate heat. So I, as I said, I don't do the uh, the traditional uh, way of uh, brooding again, of using heater. Oh no, uh, of of heating my beds. I use I produce a, a, a local heater 
I use for my my brooding. So sanitation, clean your chicken house. It's very important you clean it. Feed your feeders, your chicken, your chicken house, your feeders, your water receptacles regularly. Make sure you clean them regularly. Wash them every morning. We wash, even with the K system we use. The workers always take all the uh, the, the, the the how do we call it? Uh, the water receptacles. Most of they have to wash them every day. So that eventually they can, we can have a, a, a pure water. We ha can have clean water, free of any form of disease and things like that. So it's important you take note of clean your chicken house very well. Anytime you move, you are, you, are, you want to uh, clean the bed. You must always have an, an empty uh, pen whereby you can move the beds there and clean this place and disinfect the ground. And before you bring them back into the place. So every time I tell families that you must always have one pen that is not used for anything just for uh either for emergency use or you you want to clean a particular pen you have to move all the beds there so you must design your pen such in a way that you can move them from one pen to the other so easy so i think that one is going to help us so you must be you you, you must have you must be able to wash and disinfect the floor before you bring in fresh wood shavings you know, those, so what I do is uh, because I can't be washing the floor regularly, I try to dry the shavings. I make sure that when I bring them, I dry them on the sand. So that, uh, or sometimes I, I dry them in the pen, the empty pen, and I put the gas system on. The heat will dry them for me so they can kill whatever uh, protozoas or whatever thing that is in the shave or whatever bacteria I feel can die under a particular heating uh, condition, in the hot condition. So I do that just to avoid problem but avoid disease in my in my in, in my farm so the feeder and the the feeder and the water no the feed and the water inspect both feed and water trucks from time to time make sure you remove foreign matters uh, uh, materials from the feed when i'm brooding bears i'm always there picking my trays and shoveling it so that i can take their poo, poo out of it you know i do that just because i want this bear to have clean feed to eat Sometimes we give them the feed and we just walk away. Whatever that happens to the feed, we don't even care. And I always tell farmers that, please, make sure you have a feeder that has a cover, such in a way that the bears cannot stand on it, because I don't really like seeing bears poop into their feeders. These are some of the things that can easily spread disease too. So let's watch that. Let's watch our feed. Where we are getting the feed from is very important. And the type of water we are giving to the bears too is very, very important. The pH system of the water is important for us to know. So that eventually this cannot uh, it cannot uh, affect the beds, you know. So we have to give them clean water. So the source of your water is important, and the feed the the feed you give into the beds to how do you keep the feed? How do you where do you store the feed? You know to avoid molds and all these stuff. All these things has to be taken into proper consideration. You no, know, we you have to quarantine sick beds too. Another way that you can stop the spread of diseases you can prevent is to quarantine new beds. You have to quarantine new beds if a new stock are to be added to the flock they should first be kept in isolation maybe for instance you have brought some beds in if you went to a friend's farm or maybe somebody just gave you a bed something happened to a farmer recently he went to a a, 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 a friend and the friend said, oh, why don't you keep these beds for me i'll come and pick them not knowing that that, that bed was 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 having a problem with bed flu when this bed came in he didn't quarantine the bed he then dumped the bed into his floor it killed every one of his beds he has learned from that so sometimes external beds, as we are bringing it to the farm, we need to quarantine them first so that uh, we know how they are doing. They don't have any disease in them before we can introduce them to our 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 main uh, this thing, uh, beds or bring them into our major pens. Isolation. So when there's a sick bed, quickly isolate it from others so that it doesn't easily spread the sickness. Disposal pit. Where do you dispose your your manure? Is very important. How do you dispose them? Is it far from how many feet far from from where the pen is? You know because this bed, you know this 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 uh, this uh, how do we call it? This litter can produce flies, can produce maggots, and all kinds of things. So we should watch out for that. So that because there are foreign animals too that comes on this uh, on these litters to when you dispose them, they come to it, they bring all kind of disease and things like that. So where where do you dispose this uh, this uh, how do we call it? This uh, litter is very important. So try to sp let it be so distant from your farm so that uh, eventually you can have a safe uh, beds and a safe uh, farming or uh, farming 
uh, condition within your your farm a very proper and decent uh, 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 how do we call it disease free uh, farm so spacing is very important enough room should be allowed for each bed to move about conveniently and avoid overcrowding try to avoid overcrowding overcrowding is one of the ways whereby beds can easily spread disease so when they have chorizia overcrowded it can easily peck and when they peck the eyes of that bed that is infected definitely that bed that touches that that thing that sticky thing that comes from the eyes of the infected bed will be infected too automatically so try to space your beds very well know the dimension of that you need to space your bed you have to know all these dimensions so we look at a uh, yeah so careers avoid using to the poultry yard or into the pens they may be carriers of disease so try to avoid people even who are coming to buy eggs there should be a place where you keep the eggs it should not be closer to where the beds are where the pen is because the shoes they are wearing the sandals they are wearing can be an agent of spreading they can carry disease and bring it to your farm so you have to take note of this thing. Proper ventilation too is another point. Ventilation is another point. Ventilation, try to have a very good housing that has good ventilation so that air can pass through the housing very well so that uh, uh, the best too can have access to good air. You know, many times when the place is choked up and it's not well ventilated, it can produce ammonia. And ammonia too is a very bad thing that can have, it can give them CRD. It can give them a uh, CRD yeah so you should watch out for that ammonia too is something else that is so dangerous to this bed it can give them a respiratory problem can give them bronchitis and all these stuff so please let's have proper uh, ventilation in our pens so a uh, food bath please make sure at the entrance of your 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 pen there should be uh, a food bath there you should that you have to be putting disinfectants into it so that when anyone wants to go even the workers want to go into the pen they have to put their food there, wash the under of their, uh, how do we call it, of their, of, of their, uh, whatever boot they are wearing, whatever shoes they are wearing, they just clean it in the disinfectant before they enter into the pen. So that is another way of protecting our beds from infections of, I uh, know it can easily help us to avoid the spread of disease too easily. So okay, now so let's do find that. Finally, we want more. to look at uh, the type of disease and we end it here and we can pick our questions too. So what are the common diseases that we have with poultry beds? The common ones, one, infectious buzzer disease. That is a uh, IDB, IBD, Gumboro disease. We call it Gumboro. It's so common. The name, common name is Gumboro. And we have the Merrick disease. We have the Cosidiosis. We have the Newcastle disease, the Farpaws, the chronic respiratory disease. We have the warm light stick and mite infestation. So what, what are the common diseases in poultry? One, I said we have a Gumboro disease, that's a I, IBD, infectious buzzer disease, IBD, or the Gumboro disease. We have the Merrick disease, we have the Cosidiosis, we have the Newcastle disease, we have the Farpaws, we have the Cody respiratory disease, we have the warm light stick and mite infestation. So I don't know if you have time, we'll have just gone through all this is one after the other so that we know exactly uh, what they are and how you can control it. So let me just quickly pick this with the Gumboro disease. Yeah, Gumboro disease, yeah, the nature, this is a virus disease. Chickens are usually affected between three to seven weeks. You start seeing this problem in birth between the age of three to seven weeks. The chicks become droopy and depressed. Their feathers become ruffled, and they have whitish and watery diarrhea. You know, when you look at the event, you see it. It's so whitish, whitish, and it will be like a form of diarrhea. And to you know, it will stain the event too. That's the gumboro. Their feathers will be ruffled. You know, they'll have some. You know, their feathers will be ruffled and dropped. And you see the whitish uh, discharge at the event. So this is an, a pure example of uh, a gumboro disease in uh, in poultry birds. So you can have it between the the, between the third and the seventh weeks, yeah, between the third and so, how do we treat it? We have to, you know, you don't treat. Uh, there's no way you can cure gumboro when it fe a bed is affected with gumboro disease. You can never. So the only thing is you prevent it. So it's good for you to have a timing. You have your uh, a vaccine timetable chart. You know, your timetable must be properly. Uh, you know, fix such in a way that you know when you have to give vaccine to the best per time. For layers, 
there's a way we go about our vaccination. So the only way you can prevent this particular disease is because it's a virus. You know, you can't treat, you can't give it, a, you can't say, well, I'm treating this thing for it to go. So you have to prevent it for it not to affect the birds. And you can only prevent it by giving them the Gumboro vaccine. It's an inactive vaccine that cannot affect the bed, but to just prevent the bed from having Gumboro in case there's a in, in Gumboro outbreak, your best will not have. But listen to me, it's important for you to know this. You can give them Gumboro vaccine at the same time, the best can be infected at the same time too. Because most of the time, I realize that when people are giving vaccine, they don't watch the best after they give the vaccine. And for every vaccine, it takes two hours for it to expire. So for the time you open the vaccine to the time the vaccine will be given to the best, that time needs to be recorded. You have to watch it. And when you give the vaccine to the best, you have to be there to watch the beds so that you make sure that every one of these beds go to the water, dip their beak into the water, and take some of the water, stop some of the water so that you know that you have peacefully and wonderfully uh, this, you know, vaccinated all the beds. We don't just give them vaccine and walk away. And those people, those of us who go to dispense our vaccines. I don't know the, what, what they do in Nigeria, but in Ghana, they have Tuesdays and Friday. Those who cannot buy the thousand dollars for that, they, they are two, three hundred floors. They go to this, they say on Tuesday, they go, they, they this. But you look at the time they pick the vaccine, the time the woman has opened the vaccine, the time they take a vehicle to the farm. Before they get to the farm, the vaccine has expired. So I always advise farmers, why don't you go for a, a thousand dose vaccine? Yes, just take that risk because you are trying to save your money. It's an investment. You know, there's a way you have to apply the vaccine for the 200 beds and it will not do them anything. And eventually, you know that you have effectively vaccinated the beds. So if there's a Gumboro outbreak, even when any of the beds get affected, it can never do that. You just have a, a way you, what you have to do to not allow it to affect the beds the more. So giving them vaccine does not stop them from getting it, but it prevents them from having a very severe, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, severe uh, 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 challenges or problems that will let them die. Yeah. So when they take the virus, even when the, the, the gumbro comes up, it cannot kill them. You just have to, you know, close it, cover the whole place up, and give them some heat, heat for about two, three days, and it will kill off those, uh, those virus out of their system. We, we use heat to treat them when in case they have, uh, they have a, a gumbro problem. So that's it. So with Newcastle 2, Newcastle 2, yeah, Newcastle 2 is a virus disease. It's a virus. And the only and and, and this uh, disease to affect the bed. What do you see in bed? When chicks are first attacked, they show respiratory infections, sneezing, gapping for breath, droppings, and develop nervous system, such as they begin to the distortion of their neck. They turn their neck the other way around. You know, some of the best walk backwards in circles with constant twisting of the head and the neck and if, if they are not properly taken care of you don't if you try to help them and they die off and when they have newcastle it kills because you see the bed moving backward and turning the head we have seen it when we we're green as young men and i've seen it to people who have had a newcastle infestation on their form that you see how the best die so how do you prevent it just give them the vaccine go by your timetable and know when to give them the vaccine to prevent it from not happening you know, so when it, you know, when it even happens, it cannot really affect the best. It will be a minor thing, but not a very severe thing. So it's important for you to know that that one too can easily be handled. How you can prevent it for you not having a problem with Newcastle. Since when I've been preventing Newcastle and Gumboro, I've never experienced it before. So, but I don't go to for any that seems to be dispersed. I go buy the thousand dose or two thousand dose, depending on the number of beds I have, and I give it to them, and I'm well to go so we have a coccidiosis a very dangerous sickness this is one of the sickness i feel is more dangerous when it comes to poultry i don't know the ideas with other farmers but when it comes to coccidiosis because these are things you you might not see it happening or you might think i've prevented it by the time you know it these animals begin to show signs they stop eating every one of them move to the corner start sleeping on themselves you wonder what is happening I've really suffered it before, but thank God, God has given us some kind of wisdom we are applying now. So there's a particular way I go about preventing coccidiosis in my farm, on my farm rather. So we need to take note of it. Coccidiosis is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is caused by protozoas. It's caused by, and it's caused by a protozoa known as 
cosidia, cosidia, by procedure called cosidia, and that's why we have cosidiosis in, in poultry. Cosidiosis and is the most important of all diseases because it is fatal, and the greater percentage of losses in chicken is due to this disease. I'm telling you, I, I know what I'm saying. Cosidia is more than, as for Gumboru, you can prevent it. If we give them the vaccine for at the right time, Newcastle, give them the vaccine. Farpox, even when they have the Farpox, 10 weeks, give them the vaccine at the 12 weeks, everything will clear off. The only thing, the immune system has to be strong enough so that they can eat. So that is it. So Cosidia is very, 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 very dangerous when it comes to poultry. So farmers, I want us to take note of it and try to prevent it, prevent it. And how do you prevent considerations? It's just to give them the, uh, the, the preventive drugs. Now we have various kinds of preventive drugs and we have the ones for treatment. So what I do, I don't know if, if it will go well with you, but the, what I do is when I give the preventive drug for three days, I give them water for two days, ordinary water, pure water for three, and I come back again to give them a preventive drug. So, and that's the way God has really saved me from the issue of Cosidio. So now I don't see it in my farm. So that's the way God has helped me. So that's the you method I use. Up, yeah. Okay. So I'm running up. So finally, we have a, you know, I spoke about Farpos. Farpos is just a, it's a, it's a virus infection too that can easily be, be treated. When you see Farpos on your beds, don't, no fear for alarm. When you see those things on the waters, like a uh, saw and all those, don't worry. When you see the water at the eye with the saw, don't worry. You see the, the, the bulbs coming up, maybe the, on, the, on the legs, don't worry yourself. It can't, the only thing you have to do is uh, make sure you give them good antibiotic vitamins. Let them eat very well. Let them have enough water close to them. And by the time you give them the vaccine, you inject them the vaccine, everything will disappear in course of time. So. Uh, far pause is not any serious thing that I'm really afraid of. So, CRD, chronic respiratory disease, is caused by Mycoplasma gallispecticum. That's the name. That, that's the, 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 the bacteria. Mycoplasma gallispecticum. That's the name of the bacteria that brings about a chronic respiratory disease. So, how do you say? I said it earlier in my, in my that you can, if when your bed has this, you will know. They start gasping for breath. They start sneezing, you know. But you can easily know this in the night. You go closer to the beds in the night. You know that yes, they have. But when you, you when you put all those preventive measures that we mentioned earlier on, it is possible you can avoid CRD at the farm because CRD is a very dangerous when it spread. It spread on like that. So how do you prevent? How do you treat it? We have various drugs on the market. We have something in Ghana called CRD stop. We have tylosome, tylosine. But mostly, I love using the CRD stock. When you give it to them for five days, six days, continuously, the thing clears off, and the bears become so free. So anytime you see one bed infected with CRD, take it out of the remaining floors quickly and separate it, and that's the way you can prevent it from spreading. So worm infestation. Yeah, worm infestation. We have internal worm and we have external. We have internal and the external ones. So the external ones, currently we have various kinds of drugs that can deal with the external we have something in Ghana we call ivomectin. It can deal with both the internal and the external. So most of the time, that's what we use. When you give it to the bears, most of the time, we have to have a good time to whereby we should know when we have to give them, uh, uh, how do we call it, uh, the wormer, so that to avoid them having worms. Recently, I went to the farm and they showed me, they said they saw a, a worm, a very big worm in the pool of one of the laying beds. I said, wow, because you've not given them the wormer for some time. So it's possible that you can even see the worm in the aputu, but we can prevent it and we can avoid it by giving them uh, a schedule, uh, the worming uh, you know, procedures, I would like to say. You need to have it at your farm. You need to have a timetable for it so that you can always deworm your bed. So lice infestation, so we have these ticks and things that comes on the bed. You know, we have lice, we have ticks, and we have mites. And I said earlier on, I said mice, uh, lice can, can easily your best can really come in contact of uh, uh, how do you call it of of lice when they sometimes from the dust the litter we pick the dust we go for how do you call it? the sawdust that we pick and 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 put on the floor for the best to 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 walk on or to sleep on. So it's it's possible that the local best can infect with those litters and you can transmit those lit, uh, those uh, lice to your own best at your pen. So let's watch it where where we pick our litters from is very important too. At the Your same time, time.
Thank you very much. So thank you so much. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much to our facilitator. I'm very sure that he has a lot of things to say. And if we permit him, we may not leave here today. Yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So we are going to move into questions. I see that some people have dropped their questions already in uh, the chat box, uh, in the chat box. So please, if you have questions, kindly raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. Let me see you. And uh just to note sir our facilitator please for all questions you have just one minute to answer each question just one minute one minute for each because we have lots of questions so one minute for each questions and one thing with questions is that sometimes they intertwine so yeah, they uh, intertwine. yes so please if you have questions kindly raise up your hand uh if there's nobody raising up their hand then we can move into the chat box questions okay i think nobody's raising up their hand so thank you because we don't have time and i believe that we are very very busy people and we have a lot of things to still do today okay so somebody asked a question um she asked that what can we use to disinfect the pain what can we use to disinfect the pen? So you can go ahead, sir, to answer that question. Just yes, one minute. Yes, we have, we have various disinfectants. For instance, in Ghana, we have a uh, queenside. We have queenside we use here, and that's what we use to disinfect the, the pen. With, I, I first wash my pen with, uh, when I've removed all the litters, I, I wash it with Omo and water. And after doing that, I, I put the disinfectant into the water and 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 wash the, the the pen and it has really helped so you can we have various kinds of disinfectants on them the one we have in ghana might not be applicable to what you have in, in nigeria so we have different kind of uh, some people have local means, ways of disinfecting their pen but i have not really tried it before so what i do is i have a, a disinfector i buy and i use that and it has been very very effective so please one thing i want farmers to, to do is say uh, please your pen when you are doing the floor make sure it is always smooth don't do it a rough floor because when it is smooth when you finish using the pen and want to wash it, it's easy when you just spread water on the all the manure will, will just come up and you scrape it off and you wash it you see that the whole thing will just wash away but when you don't make it smooth and you just make it rough eventually you see some of this uh, lit, uh how do we call it the manure or the or, or the oh yeah it's it sticks into those those ground that you cannot easily remove them and when you say, oh, I've disinfected the place, a lie. By the time you bring new beds in, they can easily be infected. All right. Um, thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, Oedele uh, Bukola, I'm sorry. I believe your question has been answered. All right, moving to the next person. This person said, how do we use poop to identify disease? How do we use poop? Okay, this person asked four questions. And since it came from the same person, I'm going to join everything together so that you can just answer it at once. So the first question from this person said, uh, this, pe this person is coming, coming from Pen Paul. You know, your name is very, very interesting. Pen Paul. How do we poop to identify diseases? Well, no, how do we use what? Poop, poop, poop or what? Poop. poop, yes, they are poop. Okay. Yes, to identify diseases. The second question, when is the recommended time or time range to give Lasota, Gumboro, and Falpox? That's yeah, so, okay, that's the second point, recommended time. The third question, more importantly, what do yellow and brown poop indicate? Like if you see yellow and brown poop, what does it indicate? And the fourth question, um, what is the recommended Okay, please, what's recommended vaccination timetable for breeders, layers, and broilers? The uh, recommended vaccination timetable for breeders, layers, and broilers. I hope you got all the questions. Yes, the recommended timetable. Yeah, thank you very much. The recommended timetable, let's probably have to send it to you because it's a whole lot of things. Okay, you what, what is going to happen is that you can send it to me on WhatsApp, so I'm going to share with the community. Yes, I'll do that. I'll send it to you on WhatsApp. Recommend it. So those questions to please, you still forward those questions to me so that I'll deal with it uh, adequately. Okay. And, uh, okay, how do we how do we use poop to identify disease? Sometimes we can when sometimes when we see green pool, people keep on telling us Newcastle disease. Sometimes it might not even be Newcastle. 
sometimes maybe that bed has not really eaten well and the pile is producing that green uh, uh how do you call it it's producing that green uh, uh sometimes no our bile is always greenish like that so it produces this green food so when it's you know yeah and you find it in the pool so you might think oh this bear has a new castle he has a problem no probably he has a different problem entirely so when it comes with with the pool there are some kind of disease that you can easily identify through the pool for instance coccidiosis like this i've realized that many people look for only the red stain in the pool of the bed that is not the only way you can identify coccidiosis another way you can find because we have different kind of coccidiosis coci, coci, that causes coccidiosis so if care is not taken and you you have only the knowledge of only one your beds are going to die because probably all of them are not going to give you a red pool for you to know that they have that there are this particular pool i've discovered over time several years now you see the pool is always pale watery you know when when the birds poop you see that the pool will just be in that water you know it poops along like a watery poop but the pool will just be very thin very nasty it's not the normal pool of the bed so i came to realize that it's another form of procedure that that is dealing with birds that most farmers don't know they always only go for the how do you call it the the blood stain type so that is another that's one thing and when it comes to gumboro the only thing you can see with Gumboro is the whitish droppings, white, very whitey. And that at the vent, you see that the vent is, you see that the, the dropping is white, pure white, like milk. So that one is uh, Gumboro. Yeah, when it comes to Newcastle, yes, one of the signs is the green pool, but it is not really uh, something that you have to hold and say, oh, my bed has Newcastle. Most of the time, we have to check it on the tie. I go to the tie, you know, I do some postman, I tear off the tie and look at the tie and see if they have a new castle, I'll see it on the tie. So that is it. So as for the pool, we can easily know coccidiosis through the pool, Gumboro, uh, Newcastle, the green pool is not a determinant that, oh, that the bed has Newcastle. It can be something else, it might not really be. But uh, with a brown pool, you say the yellow and the brown pool is not a problem at all. The yellow and the brown pool. Sometimes the pool can be deep brown. Yes, and sometimes you can see that it can be a little bit yellowish and deep brown. It depends on the food they are eating. Probably the content of the feed is what is making them produce that color of, of, of pool. Yeah, so the recommended time for Lasota and Gumboro. Yes, I do my Lasota. So when with layers, the first week I do the Gumboro. The second week I do the Gumboro. Oh, no, I do the Lasota. The third week, I do the Gumboro. And I wait, I, and I do, like, I don't do first Newcastle. I don't know in Nigeria you have anything like first Newcastle. I, no, I don't do those ones. I do Lasota direct because that, that Lasota is more uh, stronger than the first Newcastle, the H1 or something, something. So what I do is uh, the first week, you give them the Gumboro. The second, we give them the Lasota. The third, we give them the Gumboro. And you wait till about the, the 12th week or the 16th week and you repeat the Lasota too. So when the bears start laying, after every three months, you give them Lasota just to uh, build up their immune system. So that's the way I go about my vaccination too. So there's, that's the recommended uh, distance. So within the within the third week and the sixth week, I should be able to give them the first firepox vaccine. So I like come again maybe at the 12th week or no, or, or the 16th week and I give them the second uh, fire pool because it will be staying for about two years. So all this thing depends on how you know you schedule the vaccination. So I will be sending the the one I use in Ghana. I will send it to the, to to Mr. Uh, Olufemi or Mr. Fe so that he will share it to the to the community. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you so so much. So moving on quickly because we don't have time. Um, what is the recommended pH of water for poultry? What is the recommended pH of water for poultry? What are the categories of drug that need acidic pH of water and those that work with alkaline solution? That's the second question. And then this person is also asking that, what's the recommended spacing for day old to maturity? I hope you got all the questions, sir. Or should I come again? Yeah, yeah, those, those questions, please, you give it to me. I will send those because it will take a lot of time. 
So oh, I'll send it. Right. I'll deal with it and I'll forward it to you and you you, you put it on the platform. Okay, so for some of us that our question may take time, uh I uh, trust our facilitator to you know answer them for us and then I'll get back to us. I'm already uh documenting those questions so yeah. you can be rest assured that your questions will be answered the reason why they can't be answered is that uh it will require uh it will take time because of the details that surround yes yes that and we have other things to do too we are almost late <laughs> yes okay so let me ask this one this person said how do we mix how do we mix drugs with water i don't know if there is a special way of mix of mix <laughs> Which well, one? I don't know. I don't know the type of drug he's talking about, but the number is uh, the five liter to the teaspoon. You just uh, put the drug into the into the drinker and you pour the water on it, and it will easily mix itself up. So that's a simple procedure to to mix drug. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ade Akin. Mr. Ade Akin, uh, the question you asked is not related to this class at all. It's not related to this class at all. So what I'm going to do is I'll still document your question and then probably our facilitator can just answer that for us because it is not related to this class at all. We've had classes where you could have asked this kind of question, but you know they've 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 passed. So probably another time, but I will see if our facilitator can actually deal with it. All right, so let's move on to another question. Somebody asked that what will happen if we don't apply Lasota for a month? What is going to happen? Yeah, I don't know at what stage he's talking about. Is he talking about when the, 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 the two weeks or the three weeks or or maybe when the best when he has done all those vaccinations and he has to give give Lasuta to them when the best are laying? So that question is so dicey. I don't know where he's coming from. Because Lasuta right. can be given to best at two weeks, can be given to the other at three weeks. You know, for instance, for instance, let me give you an example for Cox. I give Lasuta to Cox. My cocks will stay for six months before I sell them. So I, I give Lasuta to them at three weeks and I don't give them any Lasuta against them when I sell them and they are okay. Mm. So right. when it comes to layers two, we have a procedure. So I don't know which one he's talking about. He said after all the uh, the other vaccines have been done and when they are laying, when do you give it to them? Or to, you know, It's not even one month. It has to be about two to three months before you give them another Lasuta all the time. So I don't know okay. which one is talking about it. So, okay. so you can get back to me and let me get the question and I'll address it and send it to you. All right. So for the person that asked the question, Mr. Joseph Olauluwa, um, if you are still here, we can give you like two minutes for you to specify what you are trying to say or I'll reach out to you on the group so that you can then um, further explain your question so we can pass it over to our facilitator. Um, Mr. Fagem, don't worry. The, you are going to get the recorded lecture. And for all the questions that have been asked, uh, most of the questions that, that have been asked here are questions that will be very, very uh, detailed when answering them. But we rest assured that everything has been, you know, there's a screenshot of these questions and we are going to pass it over to our facilitator for answer. Some of us are asking questions that are not related to this place, but However, I hope our facilitator will still be able to deal with them. Okay, so we want to appreciate every one of you for coming. Um, spread the word, it's Livestock Hour, spread the word. When you see the link, share it to your friends, share it to your farmer and fellow farmers that okay, Livestock Hour is here and we are trashing out a lot of issues. You can imagine, we are going to be getting a very, very huge gift from our facilitator that is going to be sharing us a schedule, a schedule you know, for, for vaccination and all that, you know, these things are, are very, very rare. You know, so people will even collect money to give you these things, but you are getting everything for free. So spread the word, let your fellow farmers come for livestock hour. You know, this is good, you know, it's it's good. All right, so we are going to be having another session next week, by, um, next week. so please uh, stay tuned. Uh, I want to believe that everyone here is on the community page. And if you're not on the community page, I'm going to um, please. Do we have anybody here that is not on the community page? Let me start with that. If you're not on the community page, can you just you know just give me that hand signal? Let me see you. Okay. Uh, I don't think. Okay. I think everybody here is on the community page. Okay. No problem. 
So thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much also our facilitator. We really, really appreciate you. So I'm going to forward the questions to you um, as soon as possible when I collate everything together in a document so that you'll be able to attend to them one by one. And then I can now forward it to uh, the group for our people. Thank you so, so much. And thank you everybody for coming. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. The lecture is over, please. We can leave the class. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can leave, thank you very much.